So hello everyone and welcome to today's session. Uh, I'm Momita. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at DST Center for Policy Research. And with me, I have Dr. Mohua, who's also a postdoctoral fellow at DST CPR ISC, who will join us for the question answer session. Each year at DST CPR ISC, we celebrate the International Way Week with interesting talk by the way experts along with a poster session. But of course, this year, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't have any physical sessions. So uh, we have organized three interesting webinars for today, tomorrow and day after. Uh, today, we have Professor Jean-Claude Goudot among us to deliver a lecture on access equality and cognitive justice. What are the problems with scientific journals and research evolution? Research evaluation, sorry. This is a topic which is aligned and resonant with the International Way Week theme for this year as well. So before I go to Professor Gundo and introduce him, I would like to first invite Professor Abhinandanan, who is a professor at the Department of Materials Engineering ISC and the coordinator of the DST CPR as well. So he will speak a few words about the Way Week celebration that we do every year at DST CPR ISC. So uh, before Professor Avi starts, I will again repeat the few housekeeping instructions for the audience. So please keep yourself muted and, and if possible, uh, keep the video turned off as well so that we can save some bandwidth if there is a issue. Uh, another information also I would like to uh, provide that we are recording this event and it will also be put into uh, the online channels after this event. So now Professor Avi, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mamita. Uh, hello and a warm welcome to everyone. Um, thank you for joining us in this year's open access webinars being organized by us uh, at the DST Center for Policy Research at IASC, the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, the a special welcome, of course, to Professor Jean Claude Gaudon, uh, who is leading off this year's activities with his lecture mm -hmm. today on access, equality, and uh, cognitive justice. Uh, I have today the pleasant duty of uh, presenting a short summary of our involvement in the International Open Access Week. Uh, at our center, we have benefited enormously from Professor uh, uh, Subaya Arunachalam, who joined us as a visiting professor in 2015. He, along with another colleague, Mr. Madan Muttu, uh, played a key role in catalyzing our interest in open access and also in nudging us to organize our first event in 2017. So I am pleased to note that both of them are here with us at this event. So welcome to Professor Arunachalam and to uh, Madan. So the flagship event in 2017 was a panel discussion on institutional open access policy. And we had leaders of academic institutions such as Professor Satyajit Mayer from NCBS, and Professor Jayant Morak from IIC in the panel, which was also moderated by Dr. Sunil Abraham. The following year, we organized yet another panel devoted to this time to the topic of equitable access to knowledge. For this panel, we were fortunate to have stalwarts and open access advocates such as uh, Dr. Karl Malamud in person and Mr. Richard Poinder uh, over a video feed. So this event was moderated by uh, Pranesh Prakash, and the panel also featured Professor Arul George Karya uh, of the National Law, Law University of, uh, in Delhi. I'm happy to note that Arul uh, will be joining us again uh, as a speaker in the event tomorrow. In many respects, the event we hosted last year uh, was a major landmark in our journey. Uh, it was a keynote lecture by Professor Vijay Raghavan, the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. In his lecture, he emphasized the importance of uh, open access for everyone and especially for countries like India. Uh, he also reiterated in his lecture, India's a strong commitment to open access and the discussions that he initiated in that event uh, find an echo today in the ongoing efforts uh, to formulate a new science and te uh, science, technology and innovation policy uh, in India. We are now entering our, uh, our center's fourth year of engagement with the international community of open access uh, scholars and activists. And we are delighted to have leaders of this movement joining us and sharing with us their knowledge, 
their thoughts and their views. So we thank them for their time uh, and we thank them for being with us during uh, this wonderful events, uh, these uh, wonderful events that we are organizing. And the more importantly, we thank them for their commitment to the cause of open access. This, this is the only time I get to speak formally during this year's events. So it is important that we thank our partners, the JRD Tata Memorial Library at IASC, the National Institute of uh, uh, Advanced Studies uh, in Bangalore, uh, Azim Premji University in Bangalore, and of course, the Science Policy Forum in Bangalore. Also, my thanks to our team of DSC SCI Policy Fellows for putting together this year's programs and in taking care of all the organizational matters. I have to mention here two of them by name. And uh, so therefore, my special thanks to uh, Mohamita Kole and uh, Suryesh Namdev. Finally, my thanks to Madan Muthu for mentoring our efforts. And of course, to Professor Arunachalam for uh, leading and guiding us in this journey over these years. Uh, so with that, uh, let me once again offer my warm welcome to all of you once again. And uh, I now request Mamita to take uh, over and, and conduct the proceedings. So thank you all very much. Um, thanks a lot, Avi, for your kind words and all the motivation that you have given us to organize this event. Uh, so now I would like to introduce Professor Gudo, who is our speaker for this evening and of course morning for him. Uh, so uh, Professor Jock Dodd Gudo is one of the leading advocates of the open access movement. Professor Gudo began his career at Glendon College, York University in Toronto, Ontario in 1970. He has been a professor at the Université de Montréal since 1973. He is a long-time member of the Internet Society and served as co-chair at several occasions. He has advised numerous government bodies. Professor Gudo also served as editor-in-chief for Surface, one of the 10 first scholarly publications worldwide and the first one in Canada to be digitally disseminated in open access. In the year 2018, the Jean-Claude Gudo Prize was established to reward the best article on the issues of scholarly publication and or open access. We are very excited to hear his thought at this particular junction when India is gearing up for a new science, technology and innovation policy, what we call STEEP 2020, uh, where, where access is a highly <laughs> debated issue. Uh, the title of Professor Gudo's talk is Access Equality and Cognitive Justice. What are the problems with scientific journals and research evaluation? Uh, Professor Gudo, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Kohli. And uh, thank you for having invited me, uh, all of you, to this extraordinary privilege of addressing a, a, a really an important audience from my perspective. Uh, about in this Open Access Week. I also take advantage of this little moment to send a friendly salute to Arun, whom I see on the screen and uh, who is an old friend, and uh, to Satya, with whom I had also some very good uh, dealings way, way back in 2005 or so, when we were trying to work with DOAJ and his organization. Um, the, the, the story I want to tell today is really one to uh, aimed at positioning open access within a broader picture because i've come to realize that open access is only part of the story open science too by the way and the story today will try to show what that bigger picture is and it turns out to be an old picture it's a picture of politics and power which has to be really drawn out if we don't want to end up with an endless, endless battle, which will never achieve anything because the forces are such that if you don't hit at the right places, you'll never get any place. So you might call this talk a bit of a militant talk, but I think after 20 some years of uh, fretting and strutting and so on around open access, I'm entitled to a bit of militancy. So with my, my apologies for that, let's get started. I would like to start with some definitional terms because that's important. What do we mean by access and particularly access equality? 
Well, it means a number of things, and quite often we don't uh, we don't differentiate that. Of course, it means access to reading the material. Everybody could read. With provisos, with uh, some nuances, it would mean also access to writing. Anybody? Uh, Guido, may I in, uh, intervene? You want to share your screen? Then you can share it, please, with the Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I, so please do so. I just did. I'm sorry, I forgot about it. Yes, access to writing, which with some provisos and nuances, uh, really means anybody could write. Access to data, everybody can study it. Access to software, use the open source software model as a reference point. So essentially, what is open access? It's point one on in my slide. What is open science? Uh, so, sorry, Professor Gudo, let me again, uh, sorry for again the intervention. Uh, so I think the slide has not uh, been shown in the screen ye yet. So can you share oh. once once again? Should I? Okay, so I shut and I will start again. Okay, okay. yes, please. With that up arrow. Yes, so the, now the arrow is down. Okay. So, uh, so you choose the slide folder or shall I operate for you in case it's a difficulty? Right. Do you see it? No, we don't see it yet. Then why don't you use my slightly different older slides? They're close enough. Uh, I have just now downloaded a newer one as well. So hopefully oh, that will okay. work. Okay. okay, so you stop sharing. I will start sharing of that. Okay. 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 And, a, <laughs> and I just saw, of course, a mistake in the slide I'm using right now, um, but I continue. So open access is the point one, access to reading. And open science is ex ex actually open access plus the three other points. And of course, I forgot to add the three other points at the bottom of that slide, which was silly of me, but that's par that's par for the game. Um, let me. OK, so what is cognitive justice, which is the next slide? Uh, it's the ability, I would say, to produce validated knowledge uh, in, uh, with no reference to ethnic or geographic origin. This is actually the Mertonian concept of universalism. It's the ability to define and pursue research programs that can be driven by knowledge of objectives only. It's, it's also uh, the, uh, identifying the instruments of power that are present in the production of validated knowledge and how they can, they can be controlled, for example, with effective governance uh, structures. Next slide, please. Um, the, yeah, I see them now on the screen. That's very good. Um, what are the essential instruments of power in knowledge production? Well, there are some that are very local and some which are worldwide nowadays. The local ones, well, the first one should be the normal and natural one, intellectual preeminence. If you're very, very good, you probably ought to be able to wield some power in your own circles because you, sh you could influence those circles rather, uh, rather positively. There are, of course, legacies from the past, institutional structures and hierarchies you have to deal with. And you have, of course, in those uh, institutional structures and hierarchies, you have the processes and politics of evaluation. But you also have systems of power which are in the world. And now in our world nowadays, with one of the first ones which unhappily plays such a huge role is intellectual prestige and visibility. It's also a control of the means of communication in particular, a control over the journals. And it's, of course, related to that, there is a control over the economics of journals. And finally, there is this sort of crazy situation that has evolved, I will come back to that, which it's, uh, has brought a lot of the evaluation of all kinds of entities, from individuals to countries, through journals, which is uh, really, really silly. 
So let me go to the second part of this presentation by looking a little bit more closely at something that has happened, that is when journals from being means of communication and storage and memory for science have become branding instruments for individuals, labs, institutions, countries. Until World War II, journals were largely really under the control of research communities and learned societies. Most journals, in fact, were published by learned societies, scientific associations. The commercial sector was marginal and weak compared to the, the, that of the learned societies and the, the academies and the uh, scientific associations. The commercial journals became successful only after 1950, more or less, and really became totally dominant by around the early 90s, 1990s. One of the important elements that really helped the commercial journals to, to take dominance was the advent, advent of Garfield Science Citation Index and the JCR. Now, after the war, what made the commercial uh, inroad into scientific publishing possible at first was that there was such a brutal acceleration in the rate of creating um, scientific, scientific um, um, in the rate of, of, uh, of scientific research that the scientific association simply could not respond to, to the to the uh, to the demand, so the commercial uh, in, uh, sectors began to to move into this sector. Uh, particularly, one person, uh, Maxwell, who uh, created eventually Pergamon Press. But when Garfield created the SCI, what he did, in a sense, is that he created a way to uh, allegedly uh, evaluate the quality of journals but actually allowed to rank journals. And then at that point, journals were able to do two things at once through their ranking. They could claim an economic value. We are important journals, so you should buy us. And we are good journals, uh, so you, you, you should buy us as well and you should use us. So what we end up with is what I call an ill-defined form of intellectual value. And I say ill-defined Ill because really the impact factor and the rankings really refer to things like visibility, prestige, perhaps a bit of quality, but everything is all mixed up. While the economic value, of course, is very directly measurable, it's market shares. Now, journal rankings depend on being cited, but not cited in any way. It's being cited within a particular club of journals. And this club is organized, as we'll see, by uh, companies. The rankings lead to a very funny concept. Instead of having a look at the quality of research, you try to look at so-called the best of the journals in the rankings. So it's like, we're going to get the best human beings by making them run a 100 meter dash. And the one who wins the 100 meter dash will be, will be defined as the best human being. Not a terribly good way to define a human being, by the way. But that's the way the thing is being done and inside a club. So you might say that excellence, uh, don't be mesmerized by that term, is nothing more than an artifact of rankings. And of course, rankings are very powerful marketing tools. We are the best, we are the first, and so on and so forth. You can do all sorts of adver advertising and promotion that way. But quality does not depend on rankings. Well, rankings are not always based on quality. So you can see that the two elements are actually disjointed and they've been artificially put together by the, the mechanism of the Science Citation Index, the impact factor in the rankings it makes possible. So at that point, you have a ranking of journals which creates a competition among journals. The evaluation of a lot of people and institutions and labs and countries is being done through the journals. And the result is that the kind of competition that is being organized at the level of journals is reproduced at all levels so that 
everybody at that point starts acting as if they were essentially a mirror image of the commercial journal competition system. So since World War II, because of this situation, the competition between researchers has much has intensified for positions, for tenure, for grants, for prizes, etc. Now, I'm not meaning to say that there was no competition before. Of course there was. I'm not even saying that competition is always bad. Sometimes competition can be extremely, extremely useful uh, at very specific points of science when the problem is well defined, two or three teams are going on it, well, the competition is going to stimulate everybody and no one, no one is going to deny that or even think that's bad. But what's happening is that you have a competition which is now, you might say, uni, unidimensional. It's based purely on the basis of general rankings and everything is organized uh, on the basis of that, of that competition. Now, within the, this competition and the journals, a group of people is very important. It's the editors and the editors are important because they're also researchers. So in effect, the journals with their editors are in a position of taking over a small elite part of the researchers and then using them to create their own form of competition. And the editors that enter into this game have a very difficult time avoiding falling into the logic of this kind of a journal competition. So the result of all this is that as researchers are evaluated through the way they publish, where they publish, and not what they publish, well, they adapt their research results and their publications to what is desired by to the preferences of the journals. And what do journals want? Well, they want highly citable uh, topics. And if they are highly citable topics, that means that they are highly visible, they're highly prestigious in certain circles, and they are going to uh, enhance the, the position of the, of the journals. Now, this kind of situation, particularly adapting one's research to the preference of journals, this is the next slide, um, will lead to a number of distortions in the scientific process. And here I can only very quickly uh, refer you to a really interesting book that documents that. I don't think it accounts for the, the situation well, but it documents it beautifully. It's the book by Stuart Ritchie called Science Fictions, How Fraud, Bias, Negligence, and Hype Undermine the Search for Truth. I would call that the search for reality myself and not truth, but that's another debate and I'll leave it aside for today. But this is a book I would recommend you look at just to see very clearly how the situation in science has, has really gone down in quality and how actually the journal competition in its role has played a perverse, uh, has played a perverse role. So, what do we have? This is the first conclusion. We have a select group of journals, mainly from the North Atlantic, to use that sort of characterization of that situation. That's the sort of part of the world where I live presently, which underpin commercial publishing. These journals are identified either through the Web of Science or Scopus, which are properties of private companies, Caravate and Elsevier. A small group, a select group of researchers select the topics of choice in these journals by their perception of what's really, what's hot, what's uh, fashionable, what's going to enhance the journal. And this, this is the important point. The topics privileged by all these people in all these uh, elite journals that are set up in the web of science, all these people end up creating what you might call a de facto informal science policy. It's as if somehow all these journals let a kind of science policy emerge, as you would uh, probably argue that the invisible hand of the market uh, organizes the, uh, the distribution, the production and the distribution of goods. It's a very, by the way, a very neoliberal approach to the uh, to the um, uh, to, to the to the problem of scientific publishing. So you have a kind of emergent phenomenon, which is an informal science policy re coming to the surface, which reflects when you look at it 
uh, calmly, which really reflects uh, mainly North Atlantic concerns, interests, and so on. And which leaves aside, of course, all kinds of problems, which of course uh, are of importance for nothing less than perhaps uh, six or seven eighths of, uh, of the human population on this planet. So one can say that there is really something going not the right way here. We have a way of production, production uh, uh, producing knowledge, which is really organized for a particular uh, minority of people on the earth and not for the advantage of the whole world. So on the commercial side of journals, what do they do? Well, the, uh, the quest that I've set for citations and for improved rankings is what drives a lot of editorial choices. Better rankings that translate into a better market shares, better rankings attract researchers because they lead to higher prestige, etc. So in short, the journals have become, as I've claimed from the beginning of this talk, a branding instrument which now creates strong economic value and bad symbolic capital. <clears throat> Next slide, what about journals that are not right? I'm sorry, Mumita, I keep on forgetting to tell you next slides. Um, Unranked journals <clears throat> tend to be from learned societies that are smaller, from countries that are largely outside the North Atlantic, and in languages other than English. Now, you recognize that very readily, I'm quite sure. So, this, uh, this is why what unranked journals are. They are being marginalized, but this marginali marginalizing uh, has little to do with uh, quality, yet marginalized journals are regularly accused of being mediocre or in coded terms, they are national rather than international. By the way, the term international had been invented by Maxwell as a way to promote his own journals against the learned societies and scientific associations, which because of history tended to be very national. Uh, that didn't mean they didn't have an international audience, but they were emerging from a national organization. Now, now the term national, instead of referring to the way things are being produced, it's being referred to as a kind of provincialism, as a kind of backwardness, as a kind of sign of mediocrity. This is humbug. <laughs> Sorry to say that. It's simply humbug. So, the uh, unranked journals, uh, on the other hand, reflect quite often interesting research communities with original perspectives, original questions, and original approaches. No wonder that so many questions are left neglected, un unstudied. No wonder why suddenly uh, we start paying attention to Zika because it starts to reach the shores of the United States, while the, the, the virus itself had been known for something like 40 or, 40 or 50 years. Ne almost as much time was also you, uh, delayed in the case of Ebola. We have had coronaviruses for quite a while, and of course we didn't do really anything organized to take care of that once and for all, for the whole planet, for the whole family of these viruses. No, we just go through the hot topics, we go through the, the, the exciting stuff, and we publish in Nature stupid papers on the memory of water, which had to be retracted later, or papers in Lancet, which have to do with horrible things uh, on uh, the trachea, uh, by uh, Dr. Maria Kini. So this is the kind of uh, situation we have. Cognitive injustice begins here. So what are the consequences for countries like India, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, sorry, Dominique, uh, I forgot to add Argentina here. Uh, what are the consequences? Well, researchers are split between in countries like yours are split between international journals which are highly valued and national publications which are devalued now the evaluation procedure inside the country often rests on the opposition between international and national publications and only the former are being taken care of and since the international uh, publications driven as they are by citations, 
generate an informal form of science policy, let me ask you a very simple question. How can a country such as India hope to deploy its own science policy if it privileges international publications in evaluating its own researchers? The researchers are going to go in the direction of the informal science policy of the international journals, and they are going to, they are going to completely de um, uh, deflect the intentions of any national body that tries to respond to some of the national concerns and problems. And then finally, there is a, a, a really a terrible irony and, and, and horror in all of this. If you incite your researchers to publish in international journals, you may also in the end end up facilitating their abroad, which is really, really uh, a, a bad result. Next slide, please. It's part three, digitization network and platform. So we have to, to now say, what can we do to move forward and do things uh, a bit better? Well, let's remember one thing. Scientific journals are really a, a, a derivative or a spin-off from print. They emerge from print. Actually, when Oldenburg created the philosophical transactions in London in 1665, he was using print to bottle mechanically uh, the mail that was going on very actively between the, the, the natural philosophers of Europe uh, in the 17th century. So the uh, so the uh, so the the uh, scientific journals are really you might say a great manifestation of the print world. The problem is that we're leaving the print world, but we're still hanging on to the scientific journal as if it were an eternal sort of thing. It is not. It will disappear. But for the moment, we're caught with it. We're stuck with it, and we are not doing a very good job uh, with that. The journals, as I've said at least twice already, are branding instruments, and the journals uh, the, in the present form, as I ob is obvious now from all I, what I've said, are really part of the problems we face. In fact, I would say they are a central part of the problems we face. Now, luckily, digitization and networks have opened up new possibilities, and this has, has made open access possible. Open access is not realistically possible without digitization and networks. You need a zero cost or nearly zero cost, marginal cost of production and uh, of, mod of copying and of dissemination to make open access really work. And that needed required digitization and the internet. And now with uh, the the data and the software and the, and the rest of it, open science is just, uh, you might say, the, the uh, deployment of all the possibilities that digitization and networks are opening up to us. But once you've said all that, don't fall into the trap of saying that open access and open science will solve automatically the problems that we are facing by scientific communication. This don't don't fall into the mantra of say with open science, we are reaching paradise. We will not do so unless it be, it be shaped the right way. Initially, librarians thought that open access, this is the next slide, sorry, Mumita again. Um, the next, the librarians thought that open access could help rein in the prices of journals, but that did not happen. And open access really was not conceived to deal with the prices, uh, the price of anything. Open access was a question of access, but librarians were the first ones to support open access. So for a while, open access looked like an instrument of the fight against rising prices of journals, which in passing was also reinforcing the role of journals in the whole system, since it was the price of journals that librarians were trying to get at. The researchers were believed at first that open access would solve their documentation needs, but that again did not happen. Why? Well, because the publishers knew what the journals and uh, their form of branding instruments did to their business model, and they were not ready to give to give it up. So initially, the publishers offered a very stiff resistance to the issue of open access, 
and they did everything they could to prevent it from coming along. There was intense lobbying, for example, of the big, uh, the big commercial publishers in Washington and in Brussels to stop open access uh, being a, a policy uh, in those governments. Finally, publishers realized that open access was not going to go away and that they realized that they had to embrace it somehow. <clears throat> but they did so at that point very, very cleverly by saying, OK, we are for open access. Now we are going to define what open access means. Well, open access really means gold open access, that is a gold ac uh, and open access that works only through journals. So we have, again, the journals coming along. And then we're going to use the business model of the article processing charge, which uh, actually uh, is a good way for us to recover our revenues that way. And in fact, if we can play in that indefinite world between subscriptions, full open access journals, and the, the world in between the hybrids, Instead of having one revenue stream, we're going to create two or three revenue streams and we're going to be even richer than before. So let's go for some sort of fuzzy open access that we will steer forward the way we like it, the way we want to make it work. The point of the publisher was to, was to maintain journals as branding instruments because it's so crucial to their business model. Next slide. So what is, what is needed? What do we need to do? Well, we, des we need to design a publication and communication system that takes full advantage of digital possibilities rather than doing what we're trying to do now, especially among the publishers, which is to adapt digital, what the sociologists call affordances, that is the, the whole potential of the digital world, uh, to the print model, in effect, the publishers are trying, no wonder things are not moving forward very well, they're trying to if essentially morph the print model into a digital model that looks like the print model, which is not very, very progressive, if you ask me, but that's the way it's, it's, it's going. We need to do the reverse. We need to really take a look at the digital possibilities and really open up what we can do with the, with the uh, with scientific communication scientific publishing, and of course, the process of product producing validate, validated knowledge uh, in the world. Next slide. So to start that, because it's getting on the road to utopia now, of course, but I'll, I'll risk my, my, my moving in that direction, we need a few fundamental points. First of all, to create knowledge, humanity works like a highly distributed intelligence system. The world brain of H.G. Wells is not uh, a, a brain made by collective intelligence, as some philosophers have argued in the past. It's really a distributed intelligence. The, the, each individual works with some autonomy, but also in some relationship to the rest of humanity. And everything works in a very complex and very dynamic manner, which is actually, I think, the, the the foundation of its of its uh, strength of its uh, of its ability to move forward. The best model you can use to think about what humanity does when it tries to solve problems together is the way Vint Cerf and his colleagues um, designed when they invented the internet. It's uh, you have you have computers you can't. You can't imagine controlling every computer in the world. You don't have the central, central power to do a top-down system. So you create a bunch of protocols, a bit like the Mertonian norms, actually, uh, to, to move forward and to create, to create something like an internet of the mind, as I've argued in the text I wrote a couple of years ago. So it, it, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's the best model, it seems to me, to approach the question of scientific communication and publishing. And the best way to understand how to implement it is to look at, at how open source or free software work. And you can, with these kinds of models, understand how people can collaborate, compete at times, uh, work on divergent systems, fork off 
to a different project if they're no longer pleased with the origin, the uh, orientation of the original project, and so on and so forth. But everything is, in a sense, vibrating in unison with the whole community with a fair degree of autonomy. I like to refer that to all of this as a, a what I call phonemic individualism. It is a form of individualism like the phoneme in linguistics, where unlike the atom, it's not completely autarkic, and unlike the holistic system, it's not completely collective. It's something where you, you exist by showing your distinction and your difference, but at the same time, your similarity with those you relate with. And that's, I think, what science is doing. And that's what we've got to think about in developing a scientific communication system. Next slide. So let's look also at what publishing is. Sometimes people think about, talk about the editorial function, you know, the, or the publishing function. And uh, I've heard a lot of that in France, for example, and it's, I think, completely crazy. Uh, it's actually a bundle of functions, which are now aggregated under publisher, publishers as a single entity, but it doesn't have to be aggregated that way. What does publishing do? You capture and certify. That can be done by local research libraries. You format and standardize documents. That, that can be done with the scales of university or society presses. You all order and preserve the documents. Again, the libraries can do that. You evaluate the research, and there is the important part. The evaluation of the research is completely separate from the first three points. It's done by the research centers. It's organized by communities, for example, learned societies. It's preferably multinational communities to avoid too much of political um, in, 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 in breeding in, uh, in, in the uh, evaluation systems. And it can be done on what you call in the digital world suitable platforms. And then you disseminate the research uh, results and there again, the platforms become the, the main actor they, that emerges from this concept. Note in passing that the word journal has not appeared here. We don't need journals. We need what I like to call crystals of knowledge as temporarily stabilized form of publication that can have appear on platforms where they can be organized, disseminated, stored, retrieved, identified, found, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we are, we, the journal then can become, if it reappears, it can, it can re reappear only as we want it to reappear and to achieve the goals we are looking uh, to uh, attain. Next slide, please. In the digital world, if you want to make uh, journals reappear, you can make them recover what their basic function was, which was really the reflection of a community rather than being a competitive commodity. So the journal becomes again what it used to be, the, a group of people trying to find a way to push out their voices and sometimes by exchanging in the print world issues of their journals with similar communities, they could with one journal and several hundred copies obtain several hundred journals from the other communities. This was a very clever, efficient, and very, very healthy way of using journals. We can make journals recover these functions if we make them function that way on a, a platform. Journals really exist to help navigating the literature. You don't want to have to read every article to see whether it's of interest to you. You have to sort of find uh, road road uh, signs that tell you that you should go this way or that way. Well, journals should be organized precisely to help move through the literature and identify other literature. Already platforms such as Science Direct by commercial publishers do that. If you read an article, they suggest other articles, except they do it for a different function. They want to keep you on their platform in order to obtain more reading and presumably more citations. Here, the thing is to help science not the citation count. Journals can also begin to espouse the actual, the real flow of the conversation that is characteristic of science. 
right now because of print, we are, we're so familiar with the, with a way of publishing which is uh, completely staccato, as they say in music. Uh, you have a you know a moment when you do the research, a moment when you write, a moment when you submit, a moment when you disseminate, a moment when you read, a moment when you criticize, a moment when you start doing more research to respond to the first one, and so on and so forth. All this is very discontinuous and very, 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 um, very, uh, yeah, staccato. I'm going to use that term again. Actually, the conversation goes on all the way, and you could imagine work work processes, workflows that would espouse that conversation flow much more, much more faithfully, much more closely than what uh, is done nowadays. So the result would be we would have another a, a paper coming out with a number of people instead of having it evaluated, for example, formally but anonymously by some people under the, the control of the editors, you could have immediately a discussion start by those who want to discuss it. And of course, if a paper is not being discussed, it means that it is of no little interest to, uh, to, most, to many people, but those people who might find it through other means would, could still look at it. And those who are interested in it, in it might want to intervene on it, uh, make it better, improve it, or criticize it, or refute it, or whatever you want to do it. And, and of course, what you need at that point, exactly as in the production of software, uh, is to keep a close tab on the versions that are being issued gradually by uh, those communities that decide to work on that particular work. That gives leads to that uh, formulation I like so much from um, Bianca Kramer, in which she says we need a record of versions rather than a version of record. And I think this inversion of terms is extremely powerful to show what journals can become uh, in this new world of platforms. And if we and finally, uh, as I've said, journals ultimately are organized through platforms, which is not surprising because what is fundamentally a platform? Well, if you really want to bring it to the sim simplest uh, definition, it's a portal that is a kind of virtual shelf enriched by algorithms with, through which you can relate, make uh, documents relate to each other in particular ways and people relate to documents in particular ways. So it's, it's really uh, the platform which is going to organize the uh, this system. Uh, next, please. But platforms are very useful. Why? Because, well, they require governance. So now we have a way to put very, very openly how the political power over knowledge is acting. And it is acting like a government over a country. A, we, unless we want complete anarchy, we need a government. We don't like governments sometimes. We want to criticize them. We want to change them. But at least by knowing that they are there, and knowing how they are working, there are ways in which you can either collaborate or resist what they're doing. Platforms with, through the governance system they require would offer the same open, uh, transparent, um, targetable uh, form that uh, healthy, healthy, validated knowledge needs. Governance should be able to work across institutions. You don't want platforms to be just one institution. So that means institutions have to work together through interoperable and open technical solutions. But that's, I think, a very obvious point. Governance can even work across boundaries. In fact, I would argue that some cross-boundary system, unlike, I would say, the globalizing system of the present uh, publishing system does, uh, is, uh, is quite uh, desirable because if you add several countries into the governance of your platform, uh, you're going to ensure that even if there are political changes in your countries that are not very good, the other countries in the, in the governance system of the platform will still have a way and a voice to preserve what's um, precious in that platform. No solution, by the way, is perfect, but you can see the, the thrust of what I'm trying to say and how to work in that direction. We have a lot of examples in human history 
to uh, feed into this kind of problem. Evaluation should also work across institutions and boundaries, and again, platforms can help do that. And finally, evaluation can be supervised by the suitable communities like learned societies or by research agencies, with, preferably with input from various countries. And I would say that research agencies have, have, a, have, have I would say, skin in the game there to use a financial, a financial phrase. Um, the, the, the research agencies, the funding agencies, pay for the research, they could pay for the platforms, which cost only a very small fraction of the cost of research, and they could in this fashion ensure that the evaluation processes that are doing uh, the work they finance will be done according to the, uh, the orientation of the research program they have defined to fulfill some science policy. So you can see why research agencies might want to be very very uh, interested in this sort of thing. But the platform is not necessarily limited to only things that are supported by research agencies. Other forms of funding can exist or appear, and they could the papers can go could go there, and evaluation could be again done through processes which the platform would help uh, bring about. Next slide, please. So how do we work this model, this vision of an internet of the mind? Well, it seems to me that the working models are, are obvious. Open source software communities, the old request for comments of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which are actually forms of scientific publications, but which evolve in a way which is very different from what present day journals uh, do. You might even, uh, without sneering too much, you might even consider looking at how Wikipedia works. There are some good solutions and recipes in organizing the debates in Wikipedia, which could be co-opted and transposed in the validate, validated knowledge uh, area. It's clear that the, the aims of producing knowledge are not the same as the aims of popularizing knowledge for a wider public and showing stable, stable, uh, temporary stable uh, consensus about that knowledge. Science is more contentious, but there are things that can be uh, borrowed from Wikipedia. And finally, if you move, remove the commercial dimensions of that particular project, um, on, despite the fact that it, uh, it was just bought recently uh, by a commercial publisher, F1000 Research offers many, many of the dimensions of the, uh, of, 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 the, of the platform I dream about. I would be absolutely delighted if India put its money uh, with some other countries to create a clone of F1000 research, which is not commercial and which would allow all countries like India to do the sort of things that I've been trying to advocate for today. So, the objectives are quite clear. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, the scientific publishing and communication system that I've been trying to describe would be uh, would not be tainted by superimposed commercial objectives. So there would not be this kind of perversion of the system. And I, I refer you back to Richie's book that I mentioned earlier. The evaluation system would be completely focused on quality rather than excellence, uh, which is an artifact of competition, and it would rest on the actual study of published works rather than examining where you've set up shop inside which prestigious quote-unquote journal. Each community could design and follow the scientific trails of its choice without having to face the threat of being marginalized for not pursuing the fashionable questions of the moment. And that I think is very important to address the issue of all the neglected problems which are affecting so many countries in the world right now. And uh, see if you put together uh, models such as F1000 Research, Wikipedia, RFCs adequately transposed into the 
demands of the production of value, validated knowledge. Uh, and, and if you do all that, publishing in the digital age will be able to feed the great conversation, as I like to call it, in a fluid manner. And as you see, again, journals are essentially out of the picture. It's really the work, the organization of the work, the clusters of works that can appear. They can be called journal at that point, but they are no longer centrally journals. Next slide. So the objectives finally are clear. The engines of science and scholarship should be the needs and the curiosity of countless communities, countries, individuals, and not responding to the quest for citations of the commercial publishers. The construction of knowledge should not be constructed on the model of popular music, television shows, or even the Olympic Games. We're not looking to identify the gold medals that can be done anyway. It's not very difficult to do that, but uh, to really identify the threshold above which work is really usable, replicable, uh, is part of the, of the distributed construction of validated knowledge for humanity. Competition, as I've said, is sometimes needed and useful in science, but it should never be the universal principle of research management, especially when it converges with the, the imperatives of commercial competition. Next slide. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Goodon, for your wonderful talk and your amazing insights in open access. Uh, I'm sure it has been an extremely enriching and fascinating experience for all the audiences here. And like me, it must be a wonderful experience for all. And they must be having some really interesting questions uh, for you. Uh, so I open the floor for discussions. Uh, just a few housekeeping instructions uh, before we uh, go ahead. Uh, please use the hand raise signal located at the top of the panel to ask your questions. Uh, also, please be brief in interest of time and I'll call out your name and while asking your questions, uh, you can turn on your video and introduce yourself. Also, if anyone wants to use the chat box to write a question, please welcome. You are welcome to do so and uh, now we will read it out to Professor Goodon. Uh, so yeah, so with this, I open the floor for discussions uh, and we welcome questions from all the audiences here. OK, um, yeah, we have we have a question here. OK, uh, Professor Abhi, please go ahead. My mind goes back to about a decade ago when uh, blogging was all the rage and everybody was talking about uh, how uh, its openness is somehow going to change things and so on. And then something happened and that something is called Facebook. Uh, how do we how do we avoid uh, uh, an outcome like that? How do we avoid uh, a, a walled, a new kind of a walled garden like Facebook? Okay, um, I alluded to this, I think if I understand your question and thank you for your question. Right. Um, in um, when I said that everybody can write with some nuances, with some limitations. Right. I think the way to do it is probably find a way to essentially um, create tiers of intervention in order to allow people to write what they want, but in a way that those who are really, for example, wanting to do serious scientific work are not wasting their time on some silly, silly diversion uh, in the process. I'm not claiming what that what I was saying today gives a complete full picture of the how to organize scientific publishing. But for example, I remember that John Tennant, who unhappily died, as you probably know, last uh, last April in Indonesia in a motorcycle thing, had the, given a beautiful article in F1000 Research on the notion of um, of uh, 
uh, evaluation and peer review. And at one point in the discussion, when they were about at version three of the article, and there were about 80 people involved in the writing in that, of that particular paper, somebody came in and started insulting Jonathan Tennant, which was, you know, total noise. And that's what we do not want. So we do have to find ways. Uh, it, you need moderation. You need uh, you need uh, you need uh, tiers so that people who are just trying to get answers at a level of understanding, which is not that of research, but which is more like what does it mean when and so on, um, uh, has to be identified as such. The point there is um, people should be invited to participate but it should not create undue noise to the system. And the, the, the limitations on the noise should be made in such a way that everybody would have a sense that it's fair, just, and transparent, so that they would not be immediately in the situation of saying, oh, this is again another elite trying to impose its own uh, vision on the world. Um, there might be, we have mechanisms to invent there. If you, if you, if you follow the, my train of thought, uh, if if uh, a group of people want to sit down and start designing the whole thing uh, along with me, I'll be delighted to do that and we can start putting the mechanisms together. But your question is absolutely well founded. Science requires a distillation in this distributed intelligence. You also need to distill like in the, I mean, maybe the spirit has two meanings there. Um, the, as the, uh, the, the intelligence has going to rise in a sort of way so that after a while, it's really extremely serious stuff. And uh, in some domains, it's easy. In mathematics, for example, very quickly, only very, very intense specialists of very small fields can follow discussions between mathematicians. But in the social sciences, for example, or in uh, history, or in uh, you know, in literature, well, you know, uh, <laughs> it's a bit more difficult, and one has to develop uh, the right kinds of tools for these various models. So that would be my very imperfect and preliminary response to your extremely important question. Thank you, Professor Gudo, and thank you, Professor Rabi, for the question. Uh, next, I think. Uh, I had a hand from Sri Satya Narayan. Uh, so please go ahead. OK. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Professor uh, Gooden, you made a very interesting observation. You said journals in their present form are part of the problem. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, journal, which is a dominant vehicle of scholarly communication, is driven by a uh, branding interest of uh, uh, what you said. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I uh, you said that uh, branding interest of elite group, elite group of authors and ranking driven publishers. So in effect, uh, it is sustaining very strongly even today with almost about uh, uh, un, not so much undisturbed uh, $10 billion revenue, largely because of this branding interest of these two communities who are partners. Right. Right. Now, when you also look at the problem, uh, journal between the time the author completes the research uh, and uh, comes out with the paper, the manuscript, and it gets published, uh, depending on uh, his standing in the community, it may take anywhere even today between six months to two years. And some of the publishers, some of the articles may even never get published. They may just be lying in a preprint repository, uh, which means a journal by the time it gets published is a stale material. Now a stale material has acquired tremendous commercial value because of this branding. Now, how do you propose unbranding the journal? Uh, you need a strategy today to unbrand the journal. And in my opinion, you talked about the platform idea, which sounds excellent, which means uh, the original manuscript, manuscript of the author 
needs to be piped into the platform and there has to be an entirely different model of peer review and then take it to the community. And that's the only way to de-brand the journal. Now, do you think uh, that model could be appealing to the uh, overall scientific and research community at all who are strongly stuck with the branding value which is driven by ranking? Yeah, your question is central and extremely important. Uh, and thank you for it. Um, the um, and the fact that the the an elite group of journals has been created with a web of science and scopus, and that group of journals actually has at its disposal an elite group of editors and editorial boards uh, means that the research community is divided. It's divided between this small group, maybe. 5% or 10% of the of the whole research community and uh, the rest. So indeed there will be a resistance to that because there is power and there is there are advantages to very influential people uh, in being in that position. And that's why I think at that point the decision cannot be purely in the hands of the publishers on the one hand to be sure, but also in the hands of the researchers as incarnated by the editors and editorial boards. That would be my first step. One, what I've been arguing is that little by little, as the uh, as the uh, the issue of digitization is going to assert itself with all of its ramifications, we're going to find that the entity journal is going to be uh, increasingly weakened in its present form. Let me give you an example that can immediately appear. If you, if you organize journals by communities and centers of research and centers of interest on a platform, there is no reason that that journal should own, the, uh, should own the, its articles. It just stays there as a way to indicate that this article fits with this kind of research orientation. But another group could say, hey, this is of interest to us as well. And we want to claim that article as well, while perhaps saying it first came out in that group, but we, we want to, to use it as well. It can be useful to us. And at that point, already you see value appearing for certain articles by the fact that they are not in a certain journal, but they are in fact in several quote unquote new journals or new type journals. That's one way to weaken the journal. The second way to weaken the publishing sort of discontinuities that are behind the present print inspired journal is in the F1000 research model is to move from the document being submitted by a team of a research team to uh, the exposure. In that model, as soon as you you're ready to show your work, it is shown. And then the and then you can call on people to say, uh, could you comment on my paper as a first way to to get things moving? But people have got to be very careful because they can't just do a an anonymous support for that article. They have to come nominally and say, I Jean Claude Guédon, I'm going to say this is a very good article for the following reason, and you have to have good arguments. So you enter in the conversation of science at that point at a very serious level. So the peer review is is actually completely integrated in the reception process process and the the uh, evaluation by the community process that follows peer review as we know it nowadays. It's. Uh, it's a form of, of uh, workflow where as soon as the thing is deemed, the work is deemed to be good enough to be shown, then the community or that part of the community that's interested in it can start intervening. Now, this may have interesting, uh, interesting sides too, because if you do uh, publishing that way, why? Why wouldn't you start a problem which no one outside of India is interested in, but it's an, an interesting and important problem, and you want to do it in Hindi. So you do it in Hindi, it's published in Hindi. So for the moment, the article and the problem seem to be stuck in India. But 
as the community in India start looking at that paper and said, oh, really, that's a good paper. And they, they start arguing and evolving it and making it grow and so on and having demonstrating its importance. Then those who are in charge of the platform say, hey, this is a problem which is obviously of good quality and it, it inspires good work. Uh, let's put the resources to translate it now into an international language. Now, maybe the international language, by the way, uh, would be defined not in terms of English being the lingua franca of the world, but maybe in terms of the fact that the problem there is also a problem that affects China or it affects Argentina. And uh, because of that, uh, the article is then translated in Spanish or in Chinese because that's maybe where you're going to get the most probable reactions outside of India. So you go with that translation, then you see how it goes and eventually it could spread to the world. But you have a way, a multipolar way of defining problems, a multipolar way of bringing in non-English languages into the real conversation without immediately marginalizing and putting things aside in, in such a way that it recreates hierarchies, which, I mean, to be very frank, are very much to the advantage of the North Atlantic. It's not difficult for a Frenchman like me, Frenchman by origin, I live in Canada, but I was born in France. Uh, it's not difficult for me to learn English. It's a lot more difficult for a Chinese person to learn English. Uh, for example, so you know, getting into in getting into the North Atlantic mold is simple for North Atlantic countries, and at the same time, it excludes a lot of people. It excludes a lot of uh, interactions, and it creates a domination system, which really I find I find difficult to accept. It's not good for science. It's not good for humanity. Thank you, Professor. Good. That was really interesting. Uh, next uh, question we have from Professor Ar Arunachalam. Uh, sir, please go ahead. Professor Gida, at this point, uh, I have nothing between quality and excellence. The sound is very good. With the sound. Can you pass it on to? Perhaps the, you, you, to you, uh, the lady, and you can re repeat it to me. Sure, sure. Um, uh, or perhaps you, okay. please just move a little bit. Can, uh, I, yeah. can, I, yes. can I come in here? Yes, I just to him And yeah. His, yeah, his question is, in your talk, uh, you made a, you appear to have made a distinction between quality and excellence. Right. And uh, to many people, they would probably mean the same thing. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, he, uh, Professor Arunachalam's question is, I mean, wh what exactly are you trying to differentiate here? Uh, yeah, is that very... correct, uh, Professor Arunachalam? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is, a, this is a crucial point, and I am glad, Arun, you raised this issue. I didn't develop it enough in my talk. Um, if you look at how you define excellence, first of all, you never are excellent. You only try to become excellent. You always reach for excellence. You always, it's always a moving horizon and you go there. And the only way to define excellence is to take a bunch of us who are trying to be excellent and we, are, we race as much as we can towards the horizon. And the one who arrives first is considered to be part of the excellence team. And the first three, maybe, or the first five, it's the gold medal, the, bronze, the silver medal, and the bronze medal of the Olympic Games, okay? Now, I'm asking one very, very fundamental question here. We need, of course, the champions. They're, fa they're fantastic. We I love Einstein like anybody else, that's for sure. Uh, there, is a, there is no problem there. But is science made purely of Einstein's? Of course not. In fact, most of science, if you use the Kuhnian distinction between you know, paradigmatic shift and normal science, most of science is normal by definition, and normal science is boring, and it's made by uh, very normal people, and they want to do good work, 
and they they want to bring their little stone to the to the building and they and so on and so forth and the building goes up thanks to all these millions of little people that do decent work i belong to the second category you know i'm not einstein and i i bring my little stone and i'm very glad to do so now how do people know i'm bringing my little stone by realizing that i'm obeying certain threshold threshold elements which are making my work verifiable, replicable, uh, it can be, it, 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 is a, it is considered of good quality because of that. It, I can use it. I can use that work. It's good enough quality that I can use it. And that's what I mean by quality. So quality is defined as being above a certain threshold of, of behavior and practice in science. Excellence is defined by a mode of competition which identifies some people that are striving for excellence. Now, if you put everybody into a competitive mode and you define, uh, I'll tell you an anecdote once. I was evaluating research projects in France a couple of years ago, and we had the introductory meeting in the morning to tell us how to do our evaluations. And it was an interesting one because the man said, we do not want rankings. And one guy from Portugal got up and he said, how can I evaluate if I don't rank? And I turned around and I said, how can you evaluate with ranking? You know, and uh, and he looked at me as if I were completely crazy. But I know he was crazy. I'm pretty sound. Uh, <laughs> so the point is that quality is what science really needs. Competition in science is nice when you have a really well defined problem and two, three teams converging on it. Pauling, Linus Pauling, Verson, Watson, and Crick's in the DNA story. Fine, that's have fun. And we both, we know that those guys are excellent. We don't care about that. But the, we need to know that the work they do can be used, can be reused, can, be, can participate in the building of validated knowledge. It's a collective thing. We're treated, excellence is treating every scientist as if he were a literary author. But we don't want literary authors in science. We want modest builders, modest contributors that do their work well. And if you do it well, you're rewarded. Well rewarded. You know. Does that answer you, Aaron? <laughs> I can't. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Gudon. That was really an interesting one. Uh, next question we have from uh, Sridhar Gautam. Uh, so could you please uh, unmute yourself and turn on your video and please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Uh, sir, I was listening to you, uh, um, but some of things I got clear, but I want to hear in a statement called uh, what time like in, in coming years in maybe in five years or 10 years, can we expect the impact factor to be uh, like uh, uh, no impact factor in this world for the journals because recently uh, there is a good agriculture good research practices document was given by the university grants commission in that they are only talking about the impact factors and now we have a policy which is coming up because many of our people are looking at the impact factor and publishing in those commercial uh, esteemed journals so we have to pay huge to bring it back those articles. So at what time uh, we can see that uh, there will be a more open metrics? And second one is, uh, I want you to uh, give a statement, uh, comment on what the India should do now uh, to invest more in open infrastructures. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, if it were up to me, I would I would forbid impact factors. I would I would them and make them illegal. I would send people to jail for using impact factor. I would no. I won't go that far. But I I'm joking. But I think the um, if you look at the literature around impact factors, it is so flawed. It is so stupid. It it is so perverse. It does such bad things that I don't know why people do it except out of laziness or because it preserves a certain order which advantages certain people and not others. So uh, in effect, uh, yeah, we, sh we should completely forget about impact factors. I'm even wary about metrics. 
you know, metrics are fine for sociologists of science. These are measurement things to try and understand what's going on. But to evaluate people, you have to be very careful. And every time you do a quantitative measurement of something, you know that you're opening the door to rankings. You'll have no other kinds of rankings happening. And once rankings happening happen, they'll be merged with commercial uh, interest and uh, uh, market competition and you'll get into another form of madness. So, you know, metrics are, have to be handled very, very carefully. I think they're good research tools. They are not good evaluation tools. When you want to know what's good work, well, look at the work for Pete's sake. It's not that difficult. Read it, it takes a bit more time, but after all, isn't that what you're supposed to do? You know, I mean, are you going to just judge work by the fact that the person is, is at Harvard as published in the Lancet and uh, and uh, and therefore it's magnificent, it's excellent? You know, come on, it's a, it's a completely crazy, crazy thing. Now, a country like India, like the countries of Latin America, and I wish India could collaborate with Latin America on that, um, India should really invest on a platform a huge platform. I mean, you're a huge country. You're something like one fifth of the world's population in one country. That's uh, that's gigantic. And uh, you ha your influence on the world is going to become enormous in the next decade, few decades. You're going to be one of the two superpowers very soon. So it's, uh, you know, despite all the problems now. And uh, and it's uh, it's it's quite obvious. There is no no way to escape that. And it's a good thing. I'm glad about it personally. It's going to change a bit the, the things of the world and it's going to give different perspectives on the world. And that will be good for all of us. But India right now is at a junction where it can either maintain the present domination and superiority system of the North Atlantic in place by paying into it, by buying into it and paying into it, or it can really go back to basics and look at what kind of problems do we want to solve? What kind of evaluations do we want to use to achieve the best results on these kinds of problems? And with whom can we really collaborate, not buy into and be dominated by, but to collaborate with so that we can make our work even better by collaborating with those people? And my advice would be collaborate with the Latin Americans. You have many similar problems, many kinds of difficulties that are uh, of the same kind, and you could you could really create a powerhouse if you did it together. So that would be my 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 advice. I know it's a tall order. I know that you have a lot of scientists in India who have so much bought into the system the, uh, dominated by the North Atlantic that they will find it difficult to move in a different direction. But that's part of the political problem that's behind this open access issue. There is a political problem behind that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Guru. It seems that from Mahua's end, there are certain technical problems. So I will uh, request Mr. Madan to pose uh, his question. Over to you, Mr. Madan. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, I agree with you. Uh, the, uh, the, the Web of Science is uh, more of a research tool. Garfield wanted to create a kind of uh, fabric of science by linking references. The impact factor he devised uh, to recruit journals for his databases. When we use this uh, tool uh, to evaluate individual scientists and institutions and so on and so forth, um, uh, th th this becomes a metonymic uh, fallacy. And more importantly, as you said, I think this becomes a marketing uh, technique for uh, publishers, they, uh, they they don't leave any simple opportunity to uh, build brands and uh, market their products. In that sense, uh, in the Budapest Open Access Declaration, um, that included uh, open access journals as one of the uh, routes to achieve open access. Whereas we have the repository idea, which is as good as the uh, what the the core value of internet exemplary, uh, uh, tells. I think by by connected repositories, we could have created a platform as good as the F1000 with you know, a lot of comments involved. Should we, uh, I think my question is, I think uh, the Budapest Open Access Initiative should have focused more about uh, the repositories 
uh, by uh, uh, they should not have included journals so journals we thought is uh, journals that uh, don't charge money from authors and readers uh, web wide open access journals but now all of a sudden apc came in and then uh, uh, in the commercial publishers uh, has uh, you know completely usurped the space and uh, they appropriated the space and then now the entire talk is based on apcs uh, uh, may, may i take it that budapest declarations inclusion of journals uh, uh, should have been specific or uh, we, we should not have included rather we should have focused more on the repository ideas uh, am i correct uh, in my in my judgment uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question because I was part of the Budapest uh, Open Access Initiative. I, uh, I, I participated in the discussions of this uh, in uh, of this uh, document, and um, uh, to my, I mean, very frankly, back in 2001, December 2001, when we met, and when in 2002 in February, when we published the. Uh, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, um, I, I think most of the people, myself included, could accept the notion that depositories would be an important and useful tool, but we were still very much committed to the no notion of journal. I would say in my own case, very frankly, I had not been able to make the kind of analysis of what journals do that I'm presently, I think, able to do. Uh, that's part of, you know, as, as history progresses, you, images emerge and you see the situation more clearly. Uh, I don't claim to see it entirely clearly. In fact, I never will. But in 2001, journals seem to be important. What is, what is the problem there is, is quite simple. Right off the bat, many of us said open access is wonderful. But you must have some sort of incentive for for the public for the researchers. This is what I call the symbolic capital that accrues to you if you uh, if you do um, if you do research. You have a career to manage, and if you just deposit things in a depository, obviously you're not taking care of your career. Very few people are capable or willing to do that sort of gesture purely depositing and then just waiting for someone to come around. Uh, it's uh, it, it doesn't work very well for most people. So the journal at the time appeared to be uh, the only solution that worked. And in Budapest, there was a very intense discussion about that. Stevan Harnad very valiantly, very gallantly, almost alone, defended the repository. And the rest of us were defending the journals. Well. In the end, just to make things move forward, we agreed to put both in the de declaration, and a good thing it was. And thank, thank God for, uh, thank God for for Stevan Harnad, uh, who who fought so hard to maintain that. Now, what we need at the same time is to rec recognize that the repository, as initially offered by Stephen, um, was not. Uh, was not entirely viable because it did not pay enough attention to the issue of symbolic capital and because it relied too much on the publishing of the article at the same time in the journal, which led to a, a number of difficulties. So event, the, the, the whole open access movement twisted and turned for years about uh, how to deal with repositories and journals. I think we are now at an age where we can say the issue is not there. We, ha we can have repositories with then a layer of evaluation on top of that, and then we end up having a platform which is creating new style journals. I think if you look at the recent declarations of an organization like CORE, C-O-A-R, um, and Kathleen Scherer, who is in my home city, actually, here in Montreal, um, I think that uh, you'll see that it, that's exactly the direction in which these things are moving. Essentially, way, way back, I wrote an article saying that we should mix and match and that the two paths would eventually converge. I think we're seeing that gradually happen. We're seeing the, the repositories network more and more and the evaluation process add up on top of the repositories. The 1000 F1000 research system is an even more advanced 
version of a dynamic repository. What I would, as I have called for this morning, is that a country like India should really take over a clone of F1000 research and start managing its research through that kind of instrument. You have there, I think, the important uh, element that creates that creates the possibility of a, um, uh, I would say, healthy digitalized. Uh, scientific communication system. So, yeah, in uh, Budapest in 2001, we were still very much in the print world, despite playing with computers. In 2020, we are beginning to understand more the digital world. Now, for just reference, when Gutenberg came out with his printing in Europe in 1450, more or less, thereabout, it took it took over 70 years to get out of the, the so-called period of incunabula in which people were experimenting in all kinds of ways about how to print. And then things stabilized and you had, you had periodicals and books and so on that began to appear. We're doing the same thing. We are leaving the period of digital incunabula right now. We're going to enter the digital age, the full digital age gradually. We're not there yet. And what we're seeing now are battles by people who profit from the old system, fighting like mad with a lot of money and power to maintain their privileges. I'm saying, let's try and keep our eyes trained on the realities of the coming digital age, and let's make the best use of it for our researchers, for our countries, for our problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the next question we have is from Venkat. Uh, Venkat, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Gurdon, for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm moved to the discussion and debates on, on open access and also on research and evaluation. So I have a sign of a naive question to your um, militant talk, uh, so to say. Um, so, you know, I, I, I am a social scientist uh, who, where, uh, you know, the ideas such as Wikipedia, Internet, the start of the Internet, uh, are also power, power games. So when we frame the issue of research and evaluation as an inequity cost because of power differentials, uh, North Atlantic, the North versus the South and so on, publisher versus not so publisher, then uh, the proposed solution to replace it a in in terms of the digital world, where most of the uh, most of the access to digital does not exist in countries such as India yet, uh, though we are inching closer every day, and b by proposing a solution uh, which is which replicates uh, the model of the Wikipedia or the model of the open source system, which are often also criticised. Uh, to have power differentials where only certain, uh, you know, uh, outspoken or, um, you know, developer kinds get their voice heard and therefore the platform is skewed in their favor versus uh, those that do not have representation. So it's, it's sort of a, uh, you know, it, uh, it's more really a question than a challenge to your, uh, to, your, uh, to your proposal. I know it is the best available model. Uh, so I just wanted to know the history of the debates and why this is framed in the form of a digital world solution and not in a problem of age-old power differentials. Oh, thank you. Um, I had some microphone problems, so I, if I have not fully understood your question, please accept my apologies. But um, my argument is not to say we should do a new Wikipedia or a new internet or whatever. I'm saying we have to design a, a system for the research world, which is totally taking full advantage of the digital world. And in order to do so, to do so we should be looking around for possible sources of inspiration without being totally enslaved to that, you know. Uh, Wikipedia doesn't fit our world for a lot of reasons, but there are some elements of control of the ways things can be published and put together and kept uh, historically visible so that you can follow the, the, whole, the whole thrust of the discussion around a particular point. 
which is uh, useful. There are ways of cutting off discussions which may be useful. This is where governance comes along. This is where the communities have to create their bodies of governance precisely, not only to create, you might say, the constitution of, the, of these communication systems, but also to be able to, to evolve them as we understand more and more how the thing might better work. You know, we never know fully how it will be uh, understood 50 years hence. So let's create a system which has as basic principles, fairness, openness, uh, and possibility of change with some model which can be inspired by things like the democratic theories or whatever, but that's some, something of that kind. It's not by chance that we've been hitting country after country on these kinds of solutions, and we're sort of haltingly moving back, or even sometimes moving back uh, away from this. We're, I'm saying we should do something similar to govern a, a, a system of communication that has to be evolved, and then let it evolve as well as possible. But what I want to do is free our communication system from the kinds of powers that are presently perverting, perverting the system of scientific communication that is keeping a large part of humanity out of the game of uh, trying to participate in this in this effort and uh, and and is completely um, guided by principles which are actually commercial and not scientific. Let's move beyond that, please. That's what really I'm saying. And open access is not the answer, but it's an important element of a possible answer. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, before we end, here's a question. Um, here's a, uh, a quote on which uh, Professor Arunachalam would uh, like your comment. Uh, I'm just reading out a tweet from Madhukar Pai. Uh, from earlier today, and it's uh, that uh, it's US dollar 11,200 per article to publish as open access in Nature Journal. So, surest way to exclude researchers from low middle income countries. Um, I think we will soon need to start a decolonizing science and medical journals campaign. So, uh, Professor Nachalam wants uh, your comments on this. Yeah. Well, the the APC world is a, is a horror story, and I'm sure uh, Arun will agree with me, and I'm sure that uh, Dominique Babini will cheer along with me when I say this. It's a horror story, and when I was saying at the beginning, what is access? I did say access to writing. The limitations we might want to put on writing should not be financial; they should be intellectual at at worst. At worst, I mean, you have to be careful about that, but they should not be financial. When you when you have to pay such sums of money in countries where this might represent two years of salary or a year and a half of salary or whatever, uh, it doesn't make sense. It obviously is a crazy, a crazy system. Um, it's already a crazy system that journals have become so expensive that individuals can no longer subscribe to them. Only, only in institutions. It used to be that when I was a young professor, I was subscribing to maybe seven or eight journals personally because they were costing thirty, forty dollars a year. Uh, nowadays, it would be you know thousands of dollars for eight, 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 seven or eight journals. You can't do it anymore. So the the, uh, the 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 APC the APC solution is uh, is a scandal and it should not be used. If a country like India decides to put money aside to pay the APCs of some of its researchers to allow them to, under the name of academic freedom, which is a crazy idea in this, uh, crazy use of the term in this case, uh, under the, the claim of academic freedom, to allow these people to, to publish in extremely expensive journals because that's where they can really be uh, promoted, viewed, prestigious, and so on and so forth. I think India is doing something wrong. Simply, uh, it is essentially uh, putting its money in the wrong place. 
Suppose India used that very same sum of money to create the platform I was mentioning earlier. And suppose India used that same sum of money to collaborate with Redalic or Cielo or both uh, to in Latin America to see how to to maximize the the benefits of that platform and 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 did so with evaluation criteria which really go to the reach to the work being submitted and not to the place where it is being submitted I think I think India would come out ahead I, I think India would be in a better in a better place a few scientists in India who are used to be visiting Oxford and Harvard and Stanford might be aggrieved by the fact that they might be less invited at first by other other groups. But if their work is extremely good still, they won't have any trouble to disseminate their work in the right places and make sure that the colleagues that count are, um, are really informed of their work. And by the way, when I mentioned the word count, I would like to remind you of the famous formula. Everything that counts cannot always be counted, and things that can, and the things that can be counted do not always count. So uh, remember that when you think about metrics, it's really, it's really uh, important to put the whole thing in perspective. Thank you for this question. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have so much to ask, discuss and learn from you. Uh, but in interest of time, uh, unfortunately, we have to end the session here. Uh, it, it, it's been a, a very insightful event and very exciting for us. And I'm sure we will all go with a lot of food for thought and uh, won't be able to stop reflecting on the present normals of journal branding and excellence in gen general. Uh, thank you, Professor Goodon. It was such a pleasure, a pleasure having you. Uh, a special thanks to Professor Arunachalam. Without him, this whole event would not have been possible. Uh, thanks to uh, Professor Abhi for guiding us through the entire process. And also thanks to our OA Week team members, uh, Momita, Suresh, Madan, Famida, Venkat, Nimita, and Janice. Uh, so with this, uh, we have come to an end of this session. Uh, tomorrow, we have another interesting panel discussion at 3.30 p.m. And uh, uh, it's on, uh, is copyright a hindrance for open access in India? So with that, uh, we come to an end of this exciting session. We would like uh, all of uh, the participants here to please turn on um, uh, their videos so that we can have uh, kind of e-picture or e-selfie with our honorable uh, yeah, panelist. Yeah. Um, so, Moho, you, you please take the photo. Yes, yes. I'm just waiting for everyone to turn on their videos. <laughs> yeah. Suryesh, maybe uh, you can also take from your end just for a backup. Yeah. And thank you very yes, this much. This is another new knowledge. Yes, Professor. Thank you very much. It's been really an interesting session. Thank you. Yes, yes, truly, truly, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot.